Hi, welcome to this Fathom Forum. My name is Professor Alan Johnson. I'm the editor of Fathom and Senior Research Fellow at Bicom. We're absolutely delighted today to have with us Dahlia Shendlin. She is a policy fellow at the Mitvim Institute, the Israeli Institute for Regional Foreign Policies. She's been researching comparative conflict dynamics there. She's also a public opinion expert and an adjunct lecturer at Tel Aviv University. Mitvim has been engaged in an ongoing project looking at other conflict situations around the world and trying to develop from that lessons for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And she's here today to look in particular at the lessons that may or may not um, be there from Cyprus, which recently went through an attempt to negotiate mm -hmm. a solution that that attempt stalled in, in November. But uh, we're gonna look at the, um, the broader lessons of that conflict for, for ourselves. So with that, Jolly will speak for about 15, 20 minutes or so, and then we've got plenty of time for questions and answers, so over to you. Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, as you kind of accurately pointed out, we're doing a project at Meet Beam where we look at other conflicts to try to figure out you know, what we have in common, and, and also the contrast. I think it's important to point out that the critique of this kind of work is sometimes that you know, no two conflicts are exactly alike. Why should we compare them? They're, they can be different. Well, I agree they can be different, but I, some, I often find that we learn a lot from the differences as well. And we sometimes learn from what we have in common, uh, and on many different levels. And even if a conflict is not 100% uh, comparable, often there are elements of a particular dynamic that are valuable for comparison, and we learn from those places. Uh, and this, in, my interest in this grew out of a lot of work that I've done as a public opinion researcher in a number of other environments where I was sort of confronted with a lot of things that struck me as similar that I thought we could learn from. So that's just the background to why we're doing this. Um, let's jump into Cyprus a little bit. I don't know if people had a chance to read the paper, but uh, as you pointed out, you know there was a long and intense negotiation process that's been going on for about a year and a half since 2015, uh, when two leaders eventually were in place on both sides of the divided island, um, who were essentially considered pro-peace leaders. You know, imagine uh, two sort of a left-wing leader on the Israeli side and a moderate leader, a Fatah leader, let's say, on the Palestinian side, both sort of committed and openly and rhetorically committed to the idea of reaching an agreement, and there was a lot of optimism for the first time around this process. And I'm, I guess I shouldn't assume that people know all, you know, everything about Cyprus, but the last time there was any serious negotiation uh, on the Cyprus conflict was in 2004. There had been a negotiation, um, there was a plan that was reached, it wasn't very well agreed on by both sides, but it went to a referendum, and it was under uh, UN auspices, the negotiation was under UN auspices, many people referred to it as the Anan Plan. It went to a referendum on both sides, and it failed on the Greek side by a large margin. On the Turkish Cypriot side, they passed the agreement, but it had to pass on both sides, and so it failed, and since then, everything has been stagnant. So this last negotiation process was fairly op you know, optimistic, in a way, because it, was, it looked serious. And, you know, there is, like in, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we hear this concept of, like, if the leaders want it to happen, if the leadership is really committed to it, it will happen. Well. Leadership apparently is very important, but maybe not the only factor uh, that's important. So um, the, the negotiations went on and there was a lot of expectations surrounding the sort of final bilateral round that just happened over the course of the last two weeks and then uh, being held at a resort in Switzerland and um, just a few days, uh, I guess about last week, um, they came out of that meeting, the two leaders, and said we just couldn't quite reach an agreement yet. We were still divided on a couple of the core issues that we couldn't resolve. Uh, some of those core issues are overlapping to the things that we know about territory, you know, refugees in return, property restor restoration or reparations. Um, and so there's a sadness around that. I will say that, because I do draw on other conflicts as well, the kind of sadness about a failed negotiation process, well, is it over? We don't know. But I will just point out that this very morning, Colombia, uh, who also, you know, the Colombian conflict with the FARC, they had reached an agreement just a few months ago. Uh, it went to a referendum. The referendum failed and everybody was very upset. Well, they've the government then marched ahead and just forged a new agreement, and I've see, I just saw this morning that it's passed in Parliament. So, you know, maybe these processes aren't entirely dead, but they don't always work, obviously. Um, the paper that I wrote touched on a, a range of comparative points, but I want to look at a few that I think are particularly important for comparing to Israel, the Israeli and Palestinian conflict right now. Uh, the first, and maybe the biggest overall point that I want to make, and it is in the paper, is that Israeli policymakers, and specifically the current leadership, have really often started to actually point to Cyprus as a justification for why conflict management is okay and can work, and why we don't actually need necessarily to solve the conflict. And I think this, the importance of that growing uh, perspective in, in uh, certainly in Israeli society cannot be overstated. You hear it constantly. You hear it among the leadership openly sometimes, 
Uh, but more and more you hear it among the people. Uh, and this comes from you know genuine place. People feel like it's not possible. Uh, they've seen many cycles of failed negotiations, so why bother? And then people will say, well, maybe conflicts just aren't meant to be solved. Look at Cyprus, things aren't so bad. I would argue, and I do argue in the paper, that that's an illusion. It doesn't really work. Uh, the concept that there is a frozen conflict, that things aren't changing, is is misleading because things are always changing on the ground, either um, physically on the ground, the shape of the conflict, or sometimes the political dynamics. And in Cyprus, it's more the political dynamics. In Israel, and you know, with Israelis and Palestinians, it's actually the physical contours of the conflict due to settlement expansion and such. Um, <clears throat> I will also point out that apparently the Cypriots don't feel like it's a great, you know, gr wonderful conflict management, sustainable environment because they continue to try negotiating intensively, obviously. There are people who feel like it should be solved from within Cyprus itself. So the fact that we Israelis look at them and say, oh, everything's fine there, uh, isn't exactly how they feel. Um, in the case of Cyprus, let me point out that the, when I say the conflict is dynamic and not, and not really frozen, because I don't believe in frozen conflicts per se, one of the, the direction that it's going in has not necessarily favored the stronger side. So again, a lot of times in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, both sides say, well, time is on our side, we'll wait it out. The Israelis say, we'll wait it out and we'll keep sort of taking more territory and then by the time we have to compromise, we'll just end up compromising on much less. The Palestinians say, we'll wait it out uh, and we'll sort of become increasingly integrated and bigger demographically and each side seems to think time is on their side, but <clears throat> the Israeli perspective is rooted in the, in the notion that we're the stronger side, that we have the military power and you know, sort of political force and credibility. And so if we just wait and keep doing and taking, uh, we're sort of likely to benefit from that situation. So in Cyprus, the, the counterpart to the strong side of the conflict, it is an asymmetrical conflict, although there's, it's a little bit more complicated because on Cyprus, both sides have things that are arguably strong, but, but the Greek Cypriot side, Republic of Cyprus, is the recognized sovereign state with the political legitimacy. And they, you know, they, they are the stronger side relative to the Turkish Cypriot side, which is kind of this unrecognized autonomy. And I think they thought, well, we don't really have to rush to make compromises uh, in, in, in conflict, in, in the negotiations if we don't want to, because we have the power. But the fact is that the decades of stagnation and failed negotiation processes have not really favored the Greek Cypriot demands. Um, and so now I'll talk about where the conflicts diverge a little bit. Uh, the mainstream perspective on the Cyprus conflict, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday, is a unified island. The idea is to reunify the divided islands. So their their mainstream perspective is a one is one state, whereas in Israel Palestine the mainstream perspective is more two states. But for them that's the mainstream, and certainly that is the deep desire of the Greek Cypriot side is to have the island be reunified again. But over the years, the separation has done its own work and taken on a life of its own. And the Turkish Cypriot side is somewhat autonomous and has really a very separate life. And up until 2003, it was very difficult to even cross for Turkish Cypriots. And the increasing sort of autonomy led to an entrenchment of the division. And the negotiating terms have essentially reflected that growing division over the years. So at this point, even a solution based on what is their basic, their, their basic formula in Cyprus, they call it the bi-zonal, bi-communal federation. Okay, it's a little bit wordier than the two-state solution. But even that is increasingly reflecting the incremental division. So the Greek Cypriot side is getting less of what it wants in the sense of a completely open, unified island. Um, and just another small example, there are a number of examples, but a good example is the situation of the town of Morfu, which was uh, a Greek inhabited town in the, in the side that is controlled by the Turkish Cypriots now. And for many years it was assumed that Morfu would, was like clearly going to go back to the Greek side, going to be under Greek control. Um, and now in the most recent, and, and in 2004 it was sort of understood that it would be back, go back to Greek, to Greek Cypriot control, but now in the recent negotiations, uh, you know, t Turkey plays a large role in this, and Erdogan has made statements saying, well, Morfu will never be on the table, and this has been a difficult thing, and suddenly it doesn't look so clear that Morfu is, in the, is, is, is you know, possibly um, going back to the Greek Cypriots, where it looked like that was a given some time ago. Now, the par you know, imagine the parallel, right? A parallel would be like Ariel, the settlement of Ariel, deep inside the West Bank, just as Morfu is sort of, you know, not attached contiguously to Greek Cypriot-held uh, territory. And we, every, every Israeli assumes that Ariel, of course, would have to be part of Israel, but what if the situation just changes, the political contours change, uh, and the way you know, demographics and politics and infrastructure develop, and suddenly Ariel is, suddenly Israel says, well, actually, we're not gonna be able to forge a deal um, if we insist on Ariel being returned. It's just an example, it's not a perfect parallel, but the point is that the direction 
of time waiting out these frozen conflicts does not always favor the stronger side. Um, and that has been, that's certainly been one of the sticking points. Um, the other major example of this is what will happen now in Cyprus um, that, again, I want to argue certainly doesn't favor the Greek side. Uh, a lot of the policy experts who look at this conflict are thinking that the division is going to be more entrenched, that the idea of this Turkish Cypriot state, which they have declared an unrecognized state um, back in 1983, will be increasingly recognized because the international community can't really justify the isolation uh, that they've been under in the economic sanctions. There is even talk of Turkey being so bold as to annex northern Cyprus, which would be basically, which is the nightmare scenario for for the Republic of Cyprus, for the Greek Cypriot government. Now, I, you know, I personally think that's still a bit far fetched because it seems like that would be really provocative from the from from Turkey's side. But again, the, these failed negotiation processes, whereby the stronger side may think, oh, we can wait this out, doesn't seem to favor the Greek Cypriot position. Um, so. I want to move on to one other point before we sort of open it up, or I can talk about some of the directions we discussed yesterday. But another point that I came across in some discussions, I confess they were discussions on social media, um, where somebody said, well, I mean, Cyprus has been occupied now for over 40 years. Uh, why isn't the world as outraged as they are with Israel-Palestine? Look at all this hypocrisy. And I, I, here I think it's important to point out some differences. Um, I don't think this is just hypocrisy. There is a you know, Turkish military presence on the northern side of the island, but what you have is essentially Turkish Cypriots who are living together with the Turkish military. It's not, in other words, it's not as much of a foreign occupation for them. The other thing is for people who've been there and who know the situation, they're not living under Turkish military law. They're living under civil law. They have a civil government. It may be a government that is in a problematic dependency relationship with Turkey and a little bit too controlled by Turkey, but it is still a civil government um, and one that they elect in actually remarkably democratic ways for an unrecognized, you know, isolated kind of state. Um, the Greek Cypriot side is not being governed by a foreign army. Greek Cypriot side, Republic of Cyprus, is being governed by its own democratically elected Greek Cypriot government. So it's not the same situation of people living under a foreign, hostile foreign occupation. And the other thing is, and this is so you know so much of the reason why Israelis like to what, look like to look at Cyprus on the one hand is that it's much less violent. So when people think that the international community is hypocritical that they're not as critical of the situation in Cyprus as they are in Israel, well, there hasn't been any real conflict-related death the last. Uh, the last one I know about was like in 1996, I believe, when somebody, when, you know, there was like this one random person who was killed in a situation in the way they were protesting. And, but for the most part, this is not a conflict that where people are dying every single day and erupting into wars every two years, killing, you know, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people at a time. And so I think they should be seen differently in that sense. Um, but again, I don't see it as a frozen conflict. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what we discussed yesterday yeah, about the models so. of resolution? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we were discussing yesterday because I spoke on the panel yeah. yesterday about the confederal approach to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and it's interesting to point out that in Cyprus, again, the mainstream approach to resolving the conflict is a federation. So it's more of a, you know, a single state, a unitary state, but with a sort of territorial divisions and a number of shared powers, but a much closer relationship than, than the confederal idea. Still, the idea of together but separate, or separate but together, is something that I think is um, very much needs to be brought into the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, resolution efforts, I should say. And which is why I've been very involved in looking at the confederal approach, which is based you know, more on separation, more on the idea of real independent states, but who agree to share some of their powers. Um, and some of the things that we can look to Cyprus for in terms of ideas or inspirations or tools that we can take away are you know, residency without citizenship, so whereby people of one side of the conflict live on the other side, but they actually have citizenship in their own part of uh, the entity and vote. Uh, they've got very creative voting arrangements they're always negotiating in terms of where people would vote. The idea in a confederal approach for Israel-Palestine is that people would vote according to their national identity for national parliaments. And then, you know, they can vote for local and municipal. And there's a lot of talk, there's lots of different policy ideas that have been developed in the Cyprus conflict to deal with that that can be you know, studied and possibly drawn on. Um, but uh, the idea is that they would have more freedom of, you know, that there is freedom of movement, that people can be mobile, that they're not, you know, trapped into these areas. And I think that is the essential concept, that even if they call it a federation, and we would, you know, what, what I'm looking at for Israel-Palestine is called a confederation because it is based more on separation. The idea is that people aren't locked into 
uh, sort of hermetically closed societies in a tiny piece of land. Um, and as we talked about, when there's a land conflict, you know, you can either look at it as how are we all going to separate ourselves and live on tiny portions of tiny lands, or how can we pr provide more space and more land and more opportunity for more of the people, and arrange a political, you know, get to a political framework and arrangement that works and hopefully lowers tensions and violence, but, you know, not rooted in the idea that people can be squeezed into less and they'll be somehow more peaceful. So maybe I'll stop there and, and open it up to questions and discussions on any of these you know, directions that we've talked about. Wonderful. Thanks ever so much. For